Thank you, Mary Ellen. And thank you all for being here. Really, uh, really appreciate the turnout. Um, I am Jeff Rigner. I am Vice President of Whitman Record and Associates, WRA, here in Wilmington. I'm half of the Jeff and Jeff team. Jeff Desgoda is Dell Dot's project manager for this project. Um, so if anything ever went wrong, people could just say call Jeff and it was, it was taken care of. So um, we're going to tag team today's presentation uh, about the Jack Markell Trail. We, we know that all of you are familiar with it because you saw it on your way in. Uh, and in fact, it's pretty exciting giving this presentation here because this is where most of the meetings for the planning and design of the project took place in this room. So um, we, spent a lot of time. we spent a lot of time in this, imagining what this would look like. And so it's very cool to see. So I'll get started. Jeff will then introduce himself and speak to some of the process. And then I'll, I'll chime in afterwards. So the, the big lessons that we came away from this process with is that Sometimes you really need a significant investment and a lot of perseverance to complete a difficult project. Um, and oftentimes that's the last phase of a project. It's left because it's the hardest thing to do. The easy things are taken care of first. Um, so you can see there $25 million in funding from a variety of sources was used for the completion of this project. And then finally, that there's a champion and a broad coalition of partners that are essential to making these things happen. So I want to talk about our, the champion first. Um, this, is, of course, is Governor Markell. Um, so he really was the champion for this project. As most of you probably know, he's an avid bicyclist to this day. Um, this was what he chose to do to relax after no longer being governor, and that's ride from Astoria, Oregon to Rehoboth Beach on his bike. So uh, definitely a walk the talk and provided a lot of invaluable support for this project and making sure that agencies got on board. So this is him wrapping up with uh, Senator David Scola. And because of that, championing the process, it. It didn't make everything a lot easier, but it helped smooth out kind of the most challenging aspects of the project. So Jeff's going to talk about the overall context. Yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> okay. so uh, yeah, my name is Jeff Nisgoda. I'm the assistant director um, in our division of planning. Um, I manage the uh, local systems improvement program. Um, it's the, a program at Del Dot that uh, facilitates bicycle and pedestrian multimodal um, projects throughout the state. Um, a few of the projects that we're working on, we just recently completed this one. We are working on the Georgetown to Lewis Trail. Uh, we, we completed the CND Canal Trail a couple years ago, um, working on the um, Capital City Trail. So it's around Dover. So we tried to put three major trail networks in all three counties. Um, we happen to have two up here right now and then just build off of that and then hopefully have a uh, north-south connection one day. I don't know if I'll see it in my career, but um, I'm going to set it up hopefully so uh, maybe someday it can happen. And just, just to add to what Jeff was saying about um, former Governor um, Jack Markell, so um, this project originated, the idea originated, um, so I started working on, I did the original section um, down in Young Street off of, uh, so it would be east of Route 273. And, um, and then I managed the um, era contract where we took it from 273 uh, across Bolden Boulevard and it terminated at the, uh, the Little League Complex. And then um, I worked with our other uh, bridge section to uh, facilitate the 13 underpass, um, worked closely with uh, DRBA to get the 295 tunnel and all that coordination um, that had to go through that and then manage this. So when this project idea came up, it was like, like Jeff said, it was always one that was on the books to do, it, but it was the hardest one. It seems like the hardest things always get set back. So we're at this table and um, Ralph Reed was a director of planning at the time. And they called me in and I'm sitting in his office and so he tells me, Jeff, I really want to build this trail and I want to have it built before I leave office. And this was like 11 months and we hadn't even started the design or started any of the permitting or started to look at the environmental stuff. 
So I, I looked him straight in the face and I told him that's not possible. And I think I still had the bruise on my shin from a Ralph kick me under the table. And, uh, but I was being honest with him and I told him that um, I thought that we could have the design close to, if not um, possibly awarded by, that, by the time he left office, but that we wouldn't have it constructed. Um, we would have had it awarded, but the first go around, we had a little glitch in the uh, project uh, bid we only got one contractor to bid on it, and uh, the bid was extremely higher at that time, but come to find out, it was right in line with kind of what we built the project for. So that's just a little bit of our early history of, of how this, this project, I don't want to say originated, but it continued. So Jeff likes to, re we'd like to refer to this slide as the W slide, so um, it just shows the uh, future and ultimate connectivity possibilities from connecting Wilmington, Newark, Newcastle and then the riverfront now so you can see all of the possibilities and trail networks that can be built here so um, right now this trail is um, seven miles in length um, it does extend from the riverfront all the way down across 273 <coughs> and then it uh, terminates um, at Young Street and then it's on an on-road uh, trail network to get you to Battery Park so we've been we're continuing to work with uh, the city of Newcastle to um, explore opportunities to, um, to get an off-road trail network. We want this to be completely low stress, meaning um, it's completely off-road and there's no obstacles or impasses to make you feel uncomfortable about riding it. So there's a couple of development possibilities in and around the city of Newcastle that we're exploring and as they build out or develop out then as part of their site review plans we would request multimodal facilities and then just make those connections as we go. So seven miles, it used to be a former freight rail line, um, the Newcastle Industrial Track, of course. Um, but in Delaware, we have, when railroads are abandoned or decommissioned, we have first right of refusal state that Delaware does. So we always take over ownership. And I think 99.9% .9 of the cases, there has been one situation which I wish we'd have taken ownership down in Rehoboth, but we we decided to do away with it, and then the landowners around it, they pretty much took it over, so. Um, and, do you want to add something? <laughs> this is just a slide that shows you um, the downtown Wilmington area, just the urbanized setting that we're bringing a lot of people to, and to be honest with you, my, my, the joke that we always wrote was, Sometimes traffic's so bad on 95 that if you're coming from Newcastle to Wilmington, you can get here a lot faster on a bicycle. Um, I wish today, I mean, sitting in traffic stuck in a Delmont truck, that um, you know, if I was in this situation, that I would have had a bike in the back of the truck, because I'd have parked that the truck and got on the bike and rode down here. But um, and we do, we're doing, starting to do a lot of polls on the trails, and we're asking people questions like that: Are you using it for a recreational purpose? Are you using it for a transportation purpose? So we're starting to integrate like 60-40 on it. There is a lot of transportation usage on it, um, people going to and from work, and I think that will increase as the weather gets better too, so. Yeah. Cool, thanks. So to give you some context, and uh, we've given this presentation in places where you don't look out the window at the trail, but um, this is pretty much the context that we were, were working through. So you can see it's side marshland, um, very difficult place to, to put a trail project, and that's why it was left until the last stage. So what we'd really like to go through is, is, because this is a group of planners, we'd like to help you understand both what the planning process was and how a really pretty thorough understanding of engineering at the very beginning was needed to select an alternative and move forward. So Jeff mentioned some of the, the context here. North is to the right of this map so that it fits on the slide. We are sitting right here at the end of the Wilmington River Walk, and this is the boardwalk that goes out from this building uh, and crosses over the Christina. But there's a stretch phase two that was built by Newcastle County. The crossing under 295, which is a tunnel that, uh, that Jeff mentioned. Um, and then this was actually built as part of that. Crossing under Route 13, which we'll talk about in a second. Phase one, which was built in 2010. And then the connection into Newcastle, which Jeff mentioned. So total length is about seven miles from downtown Wilmington to Battery Park. 
So we had a lot of partners. Um, State of Delaware owns most of the corridor, uh, was responsible for design and construction of most of the trail, not all of it. Uh, Federal Highway Administration provided a lot of the funding. Newcastle County designed and, and operates phase, designed and built phase two. Uh, and they're responsible for day-to-day -day maintenance and operations. And you can see City of Newcastle, DRBA, RDC were all engaged. And there were a lot of other partners as well who were involved in advocating for the project when it started. That's a very, I'm sorry, Jeff, I didn't mean to interrupt sure. you, but that's a very important uh, part to emphasize is that, you know, it's great that we can build facilities like this, but we aren't in the business from a department standpoint to maintain them day-to-day. So we always look uh, to find an entity out there that can take over day-to-day um, -day operations in Newcastle County is that agency. So, mm -hmm. And RDA has, or RDC rather, has some day-to-day -day maintenance responsibilities as well. So there was a fairly complex maintenance agreement that was developed over a course of several months to understand who was responsible for what. So the importance of this trail is connections to neighborhoods. You know, it's not going to work either as a transportation facility or as a recreational facility unless there's a way that people can get to it. Um, it's a low stress alternative transportation network. Jeff stole my thunder that, you know, there are days that you can ride your bike from Old Newcastle to downtown Wilmington faster than you can drive. Um, maybe not the speed I ride, but the speed some of you ride. Um, and it's a really important economic development tool. When the, the trail opened, Governor Carney, you know, who admittedly has said, you know, he's not as much of a bike person as Governor Markell is, and no one, prob no governor probably in the country is. But he said, this trail is cool stuff. And by cool stuff, he means it's great economic development opportunity because these types of amenities that improve quality of life are really important for people to want to move here, so for businesses to be able to recruit and retain employees. Um, it's really easy to get to downtown. You've seen as you came in how the riverfront is burgeoning. And there are great transit connections to both DART and Amtrak and SEPTA at the train station. So really fantastic economic opportunities as well. We already mentioned that you can ride as fast as you can drive sometimes. So I'm going to work my way north from Newcastle. Um, so phase one was two miles. Uh, it is directly on the old rail line. So in terms of engineering challenges, it really wasn't particularly complex. But it got ARA funding. Everyone remember ARA from the Obama administration? Um, which meant it, the project had to be shovel ready. Well, in our case, shovel ready meant we were about to start survey. So we pretty much had to do survey, concept, final design in less than six months to get this thing out to bid. Uh, completed in 2010, um, and immediately was successful. A lot of folks immediately went out onto the trail, even though, frankly, it didn't go anywhere. It shows that there's a pent-up demand for active transportation. People want to get out and walk and bike places. We had a lot of um, usage was from William Penn High School. They used it as um, a cross-country track, part of their cross-country track at the end. And three, three schools would take kids out at recess and, and walk or run on the trail. This is what it looked like before. So we were fortunate, the timing worked out. We were very fortunate in the fact that the, the, the rail was removed, the ties were gone, the ballast was still in place. They had just put a little crushed stone, dirt, things of nature over the top of it. So we had a stable base that um, we were able to work from. It was just more of um, making sure your drainage worked properly, you know, and then um, and then working with the, the environmental constraints that you had. So get this, bold eagles out here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is a school class at recess. Uh, part of this is being able to cross streets in seven miles. All right, people who know the answer, be quiet. But in seven miles, how many roads do you think we cross? It's at least one. <laughs> Anyone? You mean for, for where it starts in, in Old Newcastle? Uh, yes, two streets, crosses 273 and crosses Bolden Boulevard, which is, is shown here. Uh, and this was a good opportunity for Del Dot Traffic to understand what types of treatments work well for traffic control devices to cause drivers to actually yield to pedestrians or bicyclists. So 
Uh, you can see we have pedestrian islands. Those are in, in place at both crossings. And uh, this treatment was less effective than what was installed eventually at Route 273, which is the other crossing. I'll talk about that in a second. So phase two was a mile and a half long. You can see that's that northern green section there that's circled. That was designed and built by Newcastle County. Um, I'm not quite sure what kind of engineering plans they had. I think they just kind of took a paver out and, and went to town, but it turned out really well. Um, extends from 295 all the way up, and it dead-ended at the time at the south bank of the Christina River. So as you were driving over 95, you would look to the side and you'd see three Jersey barriers that were blocking people from riding their bikes into the river. So that was an unceremonious uh, end point, but it just pointed to what was to come in future phases. So that was completed, believe it or not, six years ago now. So um, this was, it was really nicely done with signage. We provided kiosks and bike racks and benches in both phases of the project. So we established that as a pattern, as a design vocabulary for the first phase, and it was continued through the remainder. And you can see the trail. This is looking from over the river, looking south, so a dead straight shot. So there's a gap to connect to Newcastle. Uh, part of that was filled in, which I'll show you in a second. And then there's a piece that will depend on future development, because now it's, it's on street, on, on uh, <coughs> excuse me, on existing streets to connect to Battery Park. This is the other southern end. So the end of phase one was just to the north of, of uh, Frenchtown Road, becomes Delaware Street and Old Newcastle over here. Um, and you can't, couldn't get from here to here. As you're looking from the south, this is what you were faced with. So uh, there used to be a rail line here, as Jeff mentioned. Uh, when, it was, when the bridge was taken out, I don't know if anyone remembers that. That was probably late 80s or so. I remember when it was removed. Um, they kind of brought the road down a little bit, but not all the way down to the level of the rail line. So the road was on a big hump, basically, in the middle. And we needed to fill that in with an ADA-compliant slope. And so that's what was put in. Um, really beautiful connection of the project that Jeff worked on years before to the south. And, it, and that design called for a stairway structure to be built there, because <clears throat> we we had felt at that time that ramp was going to carry it too far into um, an impact to two residential properties. So, um, and then we made an ADA compliant network um, around to get you to that point. It took twice as long, and that's where we, from a facilities management standpoint, that's where it failed. Um, they said that you couldn't, you could not give a person with a disability. You could, you had to give them the same opportunity as a person that had the ability. So. And it made it made sense to me, so that's why we didn't. We had a you know like a little ramp in the center where you would pull your bike up and you just walk up the stairway, but it, it never. Went. Yeah, but thankfully we were able to work together and really create something that just threaded the needle with minimal property impacts. That fence to keep uh, people off the slope to the left, and it's worked out really well. Had a little more money the second go around than did the first yeah. one. Yeah, and I mentioned the other mid-block crossing. Um, this is at Route 273. Uh, the traffic engineer in me says that this carries about 16,000 cars a day, which in translation for most normal people means a lot of traffic for a two-lane road and speeds of about 45 miles an hour. So uh, what we put in here was something called a rectangular rapid flashing beacon. I know that's catchy. Engineers love to have really catchy names like this. Uh, but what that does is when someone presses a button, an irregular flash pattern pops up. Um, with little beacons at each of these signs on either side of the road. Uh, and it really catches drivers' attention. And it has proven to be very effective at getting people to stop as trail users are crossing the street. So um, any of you familiar with seeing any of those around the state? Newark, near Newark, there's one at, uh, on uh, Polydrama Hill Road. Um, and they really show up very well and are very effective. <coughs> So there's how you can see how that works. Those beacons are right up here, right above the signs. Then the northern gap, getting past two big highways, uh, US 13 and I-295. So there are trail underpasses that were incorporated into other projects. 
you may have noticed that there was construction on this side of the Delaware Memorial Bridge for the last um, 35 or 40 years, it seems. Um, so the trail was actually built by DRBA along, directly alongside. This is called northbound 295. It's actually eastbound. It turned out very nicely. They provided a tunnel underneath 295. Uh, there was an old rail line here. They really needed to remove the bridge because it was falling apart. Tunnel's a much more cost-effective option, but it was made wide and high and well lit so that it's really comfortable to ride through. Um, we are going to work on this tight turn at some point. We weren't aware that that was coming, but um, it's really very comfortable to ride through. Yes, Dave. Okay. One thing about that tunnel is it's, it's fairly dark. Is there any plan to put some lights in that tunnel? It, it is lit. I don't know if the, yes, the lights may have been out, but yeah, it was pretty, pretty well lit. So talk to DRBA if you see a problem with the lights being And you out. can't talk to them anymore. <laughs> they, uh, they turned it over to us. Oh, yeah? yeah? Talk to one of us about it, and we'll see. The other was under US-13. Um, these were bridges that went over what was a rail line and then became a road. This was the connection to uh, the Baylor Women's Correctional Institution. Uh, they created a new entrance on US 13. So this was then, I don't want to say abandoned, but, but no longer used. Uh, this bridge was to the point where these beams at one end were resting on four by four wooden blocks that were placed in there because nothing else was holding them up. So it really desperately needed to be replaced. Uh, we worked on, uh, with our sub-consultant, Mayhem Reichel Associates, an urban design palette for the project based on stone walls associated with old rail lines, which all of us, I think, have seen. Um, so what was done is this is actually a form liner. So that's actually concrete, but it has the look of stone to mimic an old railway embankment. Uh, also, very generously sized culvert going underneath. Um, as you can see, there's lighting in this one as well. Then, the easy part, the last mile. So six miles of this was built, uh, one mile of river walk, five miles from downtown Newcastle all the way up to the south bank of the Christina. You literally, from this point, could see the other end of the trail. So you could see the one mile gap. And we finally decided, okay, you know, it was time to bite the bullet. The governor really, felt it was critically important to do this. So we did a feasibility study. We looked at alternatives as to whether we go through the marsh, whether we go along the railroad, whether we go along 495 off to our, uh, to our right here. And we finally determined that the boardwalk through the marsh was most appropriate for a number of reasons. Um, it was challenging because we had to cross a river. It's about uh, 380 feet wide at that point. Uh, the tidal wetlands that you saw on the slide and see out the windows uh, this in-service rail line, Norfolk Southern, which was fairly lightly traveled when this building was built. And then the oil boom happened in the northern Midwest, and there were long trains passing by here all the time. So very important to minimize impacts to that. And we saw there was an opportunity for a signature bridge adjacent to 95. <clears throat> so here's the context of that. The end of the trail was at the bottom end of the or at the edge of the river. We need to cross the river, go through the woods to grandmother's house, and then along the rail line to get to the Environmental Education Center where we are sitting right now. He makes it sound so easy. No. It seems like it now. I don't have any hair from this name. <laughs> um, so we looked at an opportunity for Signature Bridge, and this was one of the in my mind, one of the planning uh, highlights of the project, we held a day-long charrette with a number of partners. Were there any folks? John, you were there, right? Anyone else here? No, but uh, 20 probably different partners involved uh, in the process. City of Wilmington, Wilmapco, Bike Delaware, Delaware Greenways, pri probably prior to your involvement, Mary. Um, a whole host of folks were actively engaged and really gave us great feedback on what they wanted to see in a bridge here. It should be um, easily visible from 95. Uh, it should be cost effective. Obviously, the bridge engineers were interested in doing that. Uh, and we knew this was going to be an expensive enough project. We didn't want to pour a ridiculous amount of money into the bridge. 
Um, it should mimic the industrial character of the rail line, but also this is a fairly natural area now because this is all the Peterson Urban Wildlife Refuge. So we wanted to use natural materials as well. And we finally came to the conclusion that we would do an arch bridge. Uh, this is a timber. Uh, this was a pinned arch bridge. We changed the structure very slightly once we were done, but it's all glued laminated timber, uh, really reflects the wooded surroundings of the area, but it has enough of the metal and, and piles to really feel that it's industrial as well. This was a rendering that we developed at the time. You know, we really, if the state's gonna, and other partners are gonna spend a lot of money on a project, the public should really understand what it's gonna look like and how it's gonna fit into the overall scheme of things. So we developed this rendering to show how it was gonna fit in the landscape. Was it about nine? We never broke out the cost just for the bridge. Something like nine or six. Uh, probably maybe a bit less than that, but it probably be, would have been maybe a little more than five just for the bridge itself. And then we got to the, then we had the easy part, which was actually following old railroad embankment and an old access road through the upland area here. That was straightforward. Then we had the area along the railroad. Now, this was taken from this building, as you can imagine, and we had this nice wide area right here. It was stone, it was an embankment, it was upland. Uh, there used to be a second rail line that had been taken out. So we thought, wouldn't it be nice if you just put a trail right there? The, the embankment's already ready for you. Well, discussions occurred and were elevated and were elevated. And eventually, the chairman of Norfolk Southern had the opportunity to personally tell the governor and Senator Carper, no, you can't do that. Uh, so then we. Do they, do they own it? They do. Uh -huh. They do. Yep. Mm -hmm. So. Back to the drawing board, what can we do? So we, we looked at how we, could, uh, how we could fit this in. So we were gonna go alongside the rail line right here. Well, it turns out there are a lot of things in this area, even though it's a marsh. We had the right of way of the rail line. We had a sanitary sewer easement, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. Then we had these big transmission poles and we had to go all the way out past those things to put it in the trail. And not only does that more impact to the wetlands, but also the soil gets softer and softer the further away you get from the embankment. And uh, our, our geotechnical engineers likened it to the consistency of toothpaste once we get out there. So it was pretty challenging to, uh, to do. Be careful opening that door, John. Uh, so we ended up all the way out here, and you can see this is the boardwalk that we ended up actually building. This bridge here, you'll see a little bit more about in a second. It exists solely to cross a sanitary sewer line. It's a 180 foot long, 185 foot long bridge. Um, and I'll speak more about that in a second. I'll speak more about it now. Um, so the sewer line is 78 inches in diameter. So that's longer than I can reach, okay? Um, it is a force main. It carries 50 million gallons of unspeakable substances from most of Newcastle County to the Wilmington Wastewater Treatment Plant. It was built in the early 70s, nearing the end of its design life, and there is no way to shut it off because there's no parallel pipe. So we had to be very careful during construction to make sure that we didn't disturb it. In fact, this is a temporary bridge that was built to take construction equipment across the pipe, which goes here. And you can see here some of the instrumentation that we put in to measure uh, forces on the pipe, acceleration on the pipe, vibration, uh, and any activities that set that off. We had to stop, figure out what was going on, develop an alternative plan for construction. And here's how you can see how that bridge was built. So all of these cranes, you can see three of them. One of them is one of the largest cranes that you can get on the East Coast. Uh, picked up three pieces of this bridge, all from one side, and workers in uh, lifts came up and bolted them together by hand. Fascinating to see. So 
uh, very, very exciting to, to, to make that happen. You can see how the boardwalk extended out into the marsh. You can see the arch bridge being built in the distance. You can see the consistency of the soil. Um, apparently a couple of the workers fell off the, uh, the boardwalk while it was being built and they had some difficulty fishing them out. Uh, fortunately, everyone was okay. But uh, you know, this had to be built uh, in a, we had to consider how it would be built even in the early planning process because we needed to get permits for wetlands and determine that this was the best alternative to follow. So we needed to confirm, even in the early planning process, that we could build it either largely from above, which is how a lot of this was built, or through placing uh, wetland mats, wooden mats for cranes that could then be pulled up. Or in some cases, they brought a barge into this area here to do some of the work. So it was really critically important to understand. Some of the challenges that we encountered during the construction was, um, so when you're designing it, you go out there with, you know, you take soil borings and you see what kind of soil stratas you have so you know where your bearing is when you're driving your piles. But you don't take them, but usually every two, three hundred feet, you know, you do them in a grid. Well, in this case out here, we would go from pier bent to pier bent, you know, 60, 70 feet, and the soil stratas would completely change to a point where you were driving a pile 40 feet in this location, but in the next uh, pier cap, you might have to drive it to 75 to 80 feet. You know, you get to your 40 feet and it still would be going. So it was a very difficult um, aspect to deal with because you, you know, you're creating a test pile, you're driving a pile, you're driving it based on a specific location, you order production piles, and then all of a sudden you got too many production piles because they're not long enough or they're too long, you know, whatever the case may be. So that was one of the biggest hurdles that we had. So, some pictures of the trail nearing completion. Uh, we did have some areas we didn't get to put bridges in, thankfully. Uh, so this is the area approaching I-95, the overpass is there in the distance. You can see how the, the bridge, the arch bridge was built. It was assembled on a barge, each arch, and then lifted into place. See how that came together. Oh, okay, here we go. That's why it was delaying. And I, I mentioned that we had um, the rendering to be able to show people how this was gonna work. We also developed a video to do the same thing. Pollock, tell my joke. <laughs> All right, so we don't, um, I'm not sure we have audio, but. So this was, as you can see, there's real traffic on 95 in the background, and the bridge is a simulation that was overlaid on it. So this provided an opportunity to show people, give people an experience of what the trail was going to be like, uh, show what type of connections would actually be provided. Um, give a sense of the setting that the bridge was going to be in and how it complemented that setting. As you can see, it was called the Industrial Track Trail until it was named for Governor Markell. So I'll get to the punchline in case you didn't realize it's done now. Uh, this was the ribbon cutting last September 5th, uh, maybe the hottest September 5th on record. It was, uh, it was pretty remarkable. But this picture gives you an indication of the level of partnership that was needed for this project. So you had city, you had county, you had state, you had multiple state administrations, you had both the General Assembly and the, the Governor's Office. Um, you see uh, County Executive Matt Meyer there. Um, 
a number of multiple state departments. So you've got the DOT represented, you've got Denmark represented. Um, so a lot of different folks were very excited to see this project completed. Our former Secretary of Transportation. Was. He was, yeah. yeah. And Connemara. So two, the, the two secretaries who sat with all of us in a room with all the DOT staff and the yeah. DENREC staff and saying, we need you to do this right. We don't want you to cut corners, but it needs to get done fast. So make that happen. So there was definitely strong push from, from that level. And I told them when they gave me this challenge, I said, if you want this done in this certain time frame, you've got to make sure that all these supporting sections within both DENREC and DELDOT understand that this is a state priority. So uh, we had a room full of, I'd say, 60 or 70 uh, folks from DENREC, from DELDOT, in all perspectives, all sections. And um, I think both the secretaries at that time stood up and pointed to us and said, whatever these guys tell you they need about this particular project, you make sure when you get it, you put it to the top of the list. So mm -hmm. that was the only reason, the only way it got done. That's right. So some photos of the completed project. This is less exciting for those of you who actually see it now. But, um, so a lot of these photos are from Trail Fest, which was held in late September. Um, joint venture of Delaware Greenway, some bike Delaware. So very exciting. We had thousands of people on the trail that day. Uh, and I think what was probably most exciting, even though most of the activities were here, when you rode all the way to Newcastle, you would see new groups of people. So it was not just a bunch of people showing up to use the trail from here. It was everyone from the neighborhoods around the trail coming out and just walking as part of their daily recreation or daily interest in the community. So. Very, very exciting to see. And that's what it looks like today. So it turned out pretty much like the picture. Yeah, frag minus control, there's a big problem. Yeah, <laughs> well, we do have a plan for that, so. And uh, you know, the, the project was branded with the Jack Markell Trail, it's the jam. So you see signage that explains distances and everything. And, really helps build some buzz for the project. So in the end, what lessons do we learn from all this? Um, a whole lot. Um, speaking from a more of a planning perspective, uh, we got decision makers at the table and got them invested. And that's decision makers both in terms of the more senior folks as well as the folks who were sitting at the table saying, we need to move this project forward. The more partners who are invested in a project like this, the more likelihood there is of success. Because once people start investing a lot of time, and in some cases a good bit of money in a project, uh, they really want to see it done. And I'll, I'll emphasize too, the fact that you build two ends and you can see one end from the other, becomes very logical that it's necessary to complete a project, even when it's very difficult. The public is a partner. So we meaningfully involved them by having multiple public workshops. The charrette with lots of stakeholders gave an opportunity for a lot of agencies to provide input. Um, we really honestly didn't get a whole lot of specific public input on design or, or timing or things like that. It was much more, we're excited about this project. We really want to see it move forward. And giving that to the decision makers just added fuel to the fire to make sure it moved forward properly. The only problem that we did have, so in the, from a general public perspective, the feedback we got was very positive. They wanted to see it built. They wanted to see it done immediately. They didn't want to wait any longer. But the, um, the adjacent communities were the ones that we did get a little bit of opposition from it because they thought you're going to build this and, you know, the... the prostitutes, the drug lords, and you know all the bad people of the world are going to be using this facility and then right in their backyard. And we had reached out to a lot of the adjacent communities and, uh, and asked them about making interconnections at the point when we went through. And uh, everybody turned, you know, shut the door in our face and said, absolutely not. And then the ironic, ironic thing was, once the project was done, it was operational, it was been, it's been in existence for a good while now. Um, those communities have come back to us and asked us to facilitate those connections and now I don't have a contractor out there so I can't do it. So they worked through the county and the county actually did a couple um, connections out there for them. So, so demonstrating successful results um, through the First Eight Trail and Pathway Initiative and, 
and other types of trail initiatives throughout the state that Jeff mentioned helps build support and funding for future projects. So this is a great example for, uh, for moving forward. So with that, I'll show a video of the way things turned out and we'll be happy to answer any questions if you'd like. Cool, there we go. So this is from TrailFest. You can see that is a little bit of a pinch point there. So there's some there's some striping down on the pavement now that from a directional arrow standpoint. Any questions that we can answer for you, John? Three questions. When you did the boards, did you find any shells like oysters or freshwater mussels or clams or anything like that? It just it just muck. muck. Sure. The second question is, what about sea level rise? Great question. Uh, this is all, as you can see, in the floodplain. We actually uh, elevated the structure more than we had to above the 100-year floodplain to account for additional sea level rise. So one last question. Yeah. <laughs> How many times did you have to crash the, uh, the network, that, that the critical path change, and have to go back to that group? That, Ask them to um, adjust their expectations and present them with something. Not a ton. Um, I mean, Jeff mentioned we, we did bid the project twice, so that was really the only significant delay. Um, and after the first bid, we made some adjustments to the design. Uh, we modified the loading on the the boardwalk. That was the primary one that we that we we modified, so the structure was less. Um, Less beefy, uh, but still plenty for what we need. Uh, we changed the piers in the river. Um, so we made some minor modifications, and after that, things went relatively smoothly. Um, working with a contractor is always fun. You know, He started out by pushing the limits as, as much as he possibly could, and once he saw that we weren't going to budge, we worked together reasonably well for most of the process. Yeah, I don't, I don't want this to come out the wrong way, but, I mean, we, we did work with charrettes and working groups and things of that nature, but with the time constraint that we were, you know, under to get this thing to a point where it could be advertised and potentially awarded, uh, folks had an opportunity to voice their opinion, but we had to move along. So, um, and it was pretty much a straightforward project. I think the most interaction that we had was on the, the, the design of the bridge. You know, was it weathered steel? Was it, you know, a glue lamb structure as it turned out to be and things of that nature, but everything else was pretty much set in stone. I think I think our best thing that we stand on is <clears throat> we have the same type of neighborhood or adjacent community input when we were building the C&D Canal Trail. And that was one of the first ones that we did where we connected Delaware City to Chesapeake City. And um, so what we've learned is um, when they are, when the trails aren't existing and they're just dirt roads and things of that nature, a lot more isolation and things of that nature, then those folks tend to be in those areas. But as soon as you develop them, turn them into uh, trail networks, transportation networks that other folks in a huge greater number start showing up and then those folks that are doing those bad things they don't like to be in someone's eye they like so they'll move on to other locations and i think that's the case if there wasn't i don't know if there was or there wasn't a problem I out have, here i haven't heard anything i mean the only ever th thing i ever heard about was underneath the i-95 bridge you know there mm -hmm. used to be folks maybe that we shouldn't have been hanging. Shouldn't have been there. hanging yeah. around there or living there or whatever the case may be. But I mean, I haven't seen any of them recently. So, and we we haven't had any problems with the ninety. And, and the funny thing you asked about that. So um, I worked with Denrex Fish and Wildlife Division, and they were so worried about the C and D Canal Trail that they they budgeted two additional enforcement officer positions. And those folks, those two officers, were out there for the first six months of the project, and then one was relocated to Newcastle over um, by. Like, Pea Patch Island and the other one was sent down to Sussex County because they weren't needed. 
you know, that means. Do you have a question too? Do you have a second? No, counts. Do you have a counts? So we have a trail counter that we installed out here, um, and it's on the south side of the bridge, um, and we're still working the bugs out on it. Um, the contractor originally didn't install it correctly. Um, then when they reinstalled it, there, there got water and moisture up inside of it. So we fixed that problem. Um, and then it was just, so it's supposed to be able to tell us if it's a walker or if it's a bicyclist. It can go as far as like if it's an animal, like if it's a groundhog or a raccoon or something, you know, it'll tell you that. But it's, it's acting a little funky right now, so we're still working the bugs out on it. But um, eventually we hope to have it online with all of our other trail networks. So, because um, we do get questions of that nature, like folks from Lake Hall, when they're working on new budgets and stuff like that, and they're putting more, we're asking for more money in our bike pet program, they're going, you know, justify it to us, and if we show them, throw the numbers at them, they're they're completely on board with it. So. We, we had temporary counters out for Trail Fest. We had something like four thousand people that day. Um, that's a special occasion, but they stayed out for a while, and I think it was, I think Anthony was telling me it was like five thousand a week yeah. before that that counter was the temporary one was. We've taken had out. over five hundred and fifty thousand trail users on the C and D canal oh, since it's been open, yeah. so. so you got a question in the back? Is that, do you still have yours? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, it impacts the wetlands. Did you do any mitigation or recreation or anything like that? We did not. We, we, we handled that in two ways. One was by ensuring proper spacing in between the boards and the boardwalk so that the wetlands underneath were not shaded. The big issue is it's primarily Phragmites, which is invasive, which honestly, you know, is more of a, an issue with keeping it off the trail than maintaining it. So the wetlands underneath had very, very low function and value. Um, but we also provided, there was some mitigation that was provided in terms of funding to, John walked out, yeah, so to DENREC and Delaware Nature Society in terms of programs to help interpret the, the nature preserve. They do frag minus control out here, I think we paid them 23,000 or something like that. That was a number that they came up with. So they have, each year they spray it, um, and then they have, it pays for a little bit of their, um, their in-house staff salaries and things like that, so. Can I, can I elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. I was gonna ask that question too. So out here on the Peterson Wildlife Area, there's also what we'll consider a wetland mitigation bank. So some of the impacts went to that, some of the impacts went to in lieu fees to enhance the area. Um, I think that the mitigation bank is also used for a couple of our <coughs> 95 projects as well. Yeah, the bank actually was didn't need to be used for this because, because the elevation of the boardwalk and the lack of shading, uh, it was not the core, and, and Denrec didn't consider it to be a formal impact. Was any of the, the bank used out here? Yeah, yeah it's it's out. Right past the, what's it, the generator or the, the big explosive gas, natural gas right. tower? Right up. Very near there. Yeah, right. uh, that way. So the uh, prime money's control is just control. They, they're not looking to replace that, any of that with what was here before all the time. You know, that was done. Some of you will have a better memory than I do, but probably 20 years ago, there was a really significant Phragmites removal process that was undertaken here. I remember seeing all the cranes out on, or excavators out on mats digging up all the Phragmites, and um, I d it doesn't appear that that was a very long-term success. So, you no, know, replacement you wasn't discussed <laughs> as part of this project. Yeah, this, this marsh, I was telling some of the others, this marsh was the uh, largest staging area for pintail ducks on the east coast of Black Point back in the 50s before they built I-95 and pollution and everything else, and the Phragmites, yeah, I think one of the successes to the project to meet the time constraint was, I think Jeff, both of us looked at each other and said, if, we're, if this is going to work, I mean, environmental is our biggest hurdle, so we've got to make it so it's not too challenging on us from a design standpoint. We've got to make it as easy as possible to get through the process to, to obtain that NEPA document. And that's, that's what, I mean, the only thing that we didn't, and we never even thought about it, was light penetration. You know, they wanted you know, gaps in the deck so light can still get through. And the first thing I thought of was, well, that's how the Phragmites is going to grow up through. And then sure enough, when we were building it, you know, when the construction was going on, so they come out there, a couple guys, and get underneath of it and whack it down. And, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you.
Can you guys elaborate a little bit on the hazard waste requirements or restrictions? Hazard waste? So I've never heard of it. No, just <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, what we did, what we, we had lessons that were learned from phase one because it was all the continuous same rail line. So um, it really was primarily capping in place, minimizing um, excavation. So we didn't actually have to remove and, and backfill much of anything. Um, place geotextile down to protect against future excavation. So it, it was relatively straightforward considering that it was on a rail corridor. Um, I mean, I don't know if there's anything that you're we did, familiar with that you'd like to add. But we did encounter the soils in the marshy area out here when we did the embankments or the abutments. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. any soils that we had, they were, this is a very contaminated area and the soils that we excavated had to be removed from the site and then they're taken to an incinerary and, and, and the stuff is burned off um, you know, properly and stuff like that. Yeah. But um, other than that. Fairly small quantity. Yeah. yeah. They barged it down to Newport and mm -hmm. loaded it up. Yes, Tom. What is it to design decision for a boardwalk? Like how long do they last? And do you, for a project like this, I assume you have to project the budget for maintenance and upkeep and eventually replacement. Yeah, I, I honestly don't have numbers for you. I don't recall. Um, we went through a life cycle cost analysis of, of what you would incorporate basically to provide the loading that we, we needed. We couldn't use something like a Trex or you know, composite product that wasn't going to provide enough strength. Uh, the alternative was Ipe, which is tropical wood, which you find on the bridge that you walked across. Um, it's nearly as hard as iron costs about five times as much as conventional pressure treated lumber. So uh, we used EPE on the first ramp here to tie in visually to what exists on this boardwalk and everything else is pressure treated. So yeah, there's responsibility for day-to-day, um, -day, you know, replacement of, of, of messed up boards as the counties, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And any major structural issues would be dealt with by DelDot in the long term. That's built into their maintenance budget. Josh. Is open at night? Yes. It is open it's at night. It lit. is not lit. I mean, that was my question because I was wondering if there's any usage. Can we talk about counts? Yeah, it's a it's a twenty four hour I mean because of the money we use congestion mm -hmm. mitigation air quality funding and we had to justify it through a transportation aspect of it. So that was one of the key things. They used to have a gate down here at the bottom of the trail that right by the vehicular gate that they used to lock at night. Um, now that's left open, you know, once the trail was, was open. But yeah, you can use this trail. We talked about lighting during the design development yeah, process. Um, everybody was in favor of it, but I was like, okay, well, I need somebody to stand up and put your hand up and tell me who's going to maintain it and who's going to pay for it and all that kind of stuff. Nobody wanted to do that. So um, we actually yeah, we do, have, we do have conduit in the bridge. So we did so. think ahead. Yeah. So if somebody wants to go out there and put it in, what we thought about is, you know, let's put the conduit in now, make it simpler, and then they can just tag onto it and run the lines up. But I also thought like solar panels mm -hmm. or something like that out there, you know. Yeah. But I think that, honestly, in my opinion, I think that's something that's going to come shortly. I, I think it's... It's being, I mean, you get through this summer, spring and summer, when these numbers start going ridiculously high out here, and then people want to be out here, you know, when the days are longer, you know, 8.30, 9 o'clock, as long as the bugs aren't too bad, right, you know. Yeah. Um, I think that's going to be when they're going to want, now the bridge is lit. That's the yeah, only exact way. Well, I've seen the bridge lit, that's why yeah. I asked yeah. the question. I, I thought it would be good for the group to know, because I've seen the bridge lit. Yeah, yeah. every once in a while, I've seen the bridge out there, yeah, because yeah. I was curious what kind of usage at night, being that that would make it have a great transportation to it. Yep. Just didn't know if, uh, if anybody was uh, doing that. We spent a lot of time sorting through that. So I think it was the right decision in the short term, but I, I agree with you, Jeff. I think that's going to be coming in the future. Well, like I said, it's a smart decision. We'll put the condo in. That's cool. There's an upland area just, I believe, on the north side of the bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, Site used for construction stations, supposed to no trespass. Is there a resource that's protecting, or is it just to keep people from? Uh, I didn't know there was a no trespassing sign. Yeah, to be honest I know exactly the area you're talking about, but I didn't know there was any no trespassing. Yeah. This this side of the trail, 
So yeah. it could be the counties it could be so having close to the rail line. So th so this side this is all the um, wildlife refuge. So every bit of the land on this side. Some on this side as well. And then there's the, uh, it's what I'm looking for, easement for the billboard here and the uh, right of way of I-95. So there's nothing that's, I'm not, honestly, I'm not sure, Bill. I believe it's close. Interesting. Might just be a nuisance. Yeah, I don't know. That could be. Good question. That's where the electric came from, from the bridge too, from that. Yes, the board, from, from the, the billboard. billboard. And I think it's been removed though. When, when our facilities management folks were down here and they found out that, that they were like, well, if we have to maintain the operational component of that, then we don't want to tag in. And they ran it, they dis disconnected from that and ran it up to 95 and tagged into a system on the 95 embankment, so. Yeah. There's something we didn't. Any other questions? Did you guys have, I mean, the, uh, this, uh, this is like the partnership with the, with the nature center here and the trail. Mm, yeah, that, was, that, was, that was huge. huge. Yeah. yeah. Um, wow, where do we start? Well, it was only successful if they allowed it because right. they own this system out here and we were tagging into it. So I remember sitting down with his. Well, name. RDC owns the owns this, right. uh, Riverfront Development Corporation. Okay. But oh, is the, this property? Yes, okay. yes, they do. Yep. Okay. Um, In the Riverfront, the Delaware the Nature Society, of course, operates the refuge and this building and everything. Okay. So one of the key things was to make sure that there is the opportunity for future access mm -hmm. to the marsh. We had some discussions about maybe having like a ramp down and being able to actually get down and, and have programs at the marsh level. That didn't end up happening. We put the gates in. Uh, but the gates are in place <laughs> so that we could provide that in the future if we need to. And you just lift um, them up. But this is a great opportunity too because uh, before this was built, <coughs> excuse me, before this was built, this gut right here, Mill Creek, goes all the way up to the railroad. And there was no way to get from this building over to the west side of the, uh, the refuge, which they mentioned all along was by far the more interesting side, biologically, uh, because of the interface between upland and, and marsh areas. And there's a lot more going on here than just the tidal marsh that's right out here. Um, and the only way they could do that was by if they wanted to get to that land, they would have to trespass on railroad property. Um, so now there's a legal, comfortable way to be able to bring classes out there. What would be your recommendation, having done this project, to uh, accelerate the, uh, the links uh, that are non-stressed between, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Wellington and Newark and Newark and Old Newcastle and uh, let's say Newcastle and uh, Alaska, all the connections. Um, or what would you e say should be the next project? Elect, the, the first so, step I would do is elect the state's, the U.S.'s most bike friendly governor. That would be a good thing to do because then you'd get a real champion behind it. But I'm glad you mentioned it because we didn't get into connections all that much, and I would like to show this if we have a moment. Yes, it was. Yes, I mean, that's one of the things that Jeff talked about earlier is the champion, have a champion behind the project. So in this case, you had the governor. Um, you know, I remember sitting down with our chief engineer, Rob McCleary, and, you know, basically told me, Jeff, the checkbook's open, just make sure this project gets done. So that, helped a lot. Um, I wasn't worried about cutting corners or we could pay a premium to have these guys accelerate design and I didn't have to worry about the cost of a bridge to get across the Christina River because the project wasn't successful without it. Um, uh, so that, those types of things, they, those types of things helped a lot. And, and the fact that the setting that we were going through helped us out quite a bit too. So you were through a, a natural setting where there wasn't development already. A lot of the times you know, having the fourth 
thought to think in the design or the trail component into uh, a site plan when uh, you know an, uh, a business is coming along for, to redevelop an area you know so that that helps a lot because a lot of the like Newark to Wilmington and stuff like that those that trail there's many different alignments of it but a lot of them have obstructions along the way where you know you're having to get out on a major throughway because there's not enough area the buildings too close to the road or parking lot nobody wants to give up parking and things like that so so I think there are two answers to your question Dave one is that um, County Executive Matt Meyer who is an avid cyclist and recognizes the benefits of walking and biking to Newcastle County as a whole has initiated something called the Connecting Communities Initiative which is a series of trail connections throughout Newcastle County that will make some of those critical connections to Newark, to Glasgow, uh, actually even to south of the canal. Um, there are two specific projects that are moving forward with that initiative. Uh, and I apologize, this isn't going to show up terribly well. But um, when you go out the boardwalk and you get up to 95, uh, there's a large bridge that carries 95 over the railroad. Uh, the first of those trail studies is the Newport River Trail, which will connect along the north bank of the Christina River into downtown Newport, which is uh, primed for significant redevelopment, potential for a new train station along the SEPTA Newark to Wilmington line. Uh, and that feasibility study is underway. And that has the potential to connect further west through basically along the edge of Churchman's Marsh to a number of other potential trail routes toward Newark. And the second one is called the Commons Boulevard Trail, which picks up just on the bottom side of 295. There was an old rail line that extended here across to 141, where the news journal is located. And then that trail would connect along the north side of Commons Boulevard over basically as far as the, the far end of Corporate Commons. So that would connect one of the largest, probably the largest suburban employment center in Newcastle County with downtown Wilmington and old Newcastle. And again, the potential for that to connect further down to Churchman's Road, which would then go towards Newark and Glasgow, <coughs> um, provides an opportunity. So I think the second part of the answer is this shows that those things are possible. It creates a spine that other connections can tie into and the fact that it was a difficult project shows that it's possible to, and in fact desirable in some cases, to build difficult trail projects. The Newport River Trail potentially has sections that will be over open water over the Christina River. Uh, feasibility study isn't done, but that's kind of where it's pointed right now. Uh, but we know we can do it because this trail was successful. Yes. How high is this bridge over the Christina River above high tide? Fourteen and a half feet, more or less. <laughs> we went through a long study with the Corps to determine what the appropriate clearance was for recreational vehicles. Actually, this bridge here is six feet above high tide. Um, and it's supposed to be a swing it's, bridge. It's movable. Yeah. Although the although the rail is literally welded continuously across the bridge, so it's not movable. All right. I think we are over time. So.